In terms of the sales and transactions from the Mali to the Europeans were not always fair, and there are many long-standing disputes. Often the land that the pioneers got was marginal and hard to farm or inaccessible, and pioneers with economic land would just walk off and leave their buildings, and this happened quite often. The original pioneers who opened up the Abu Abu Valley couldn't make it work, and they walked off. So now I'm going to jump forward about 100 years um, to the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s. Um, in this period, there was a, a big movement um, globally called the Back to the Land Movement. Dissatisfied young people wanted to escape from the modern world and get away from it all. Many of them chose to go back to the land in the United States and elsewhere. They wanted to build new communal lives in the countryside. In the States, this movement got so big that it registered on the American census, the US census. And um, just a little footnote, uh, a publication of that era, era the Whole Earth Catalogue, um, was one of the manuals of the movement. It had instructions for how to build solar panels and raise birds and all different kinds of things for the back of the landers. And uh, one interesting thing is that the editors of that catalogue um, eventually became the evangelists of cyberspace. They were the ones who were the editors of Wired and the Californian um, proponents of the digital culture. Um, so the people who were the first founders of the Back to the Land movement in the States were also the founders of the first online communities. Um, in New Zealand in 1974, the government decided to give some of this uh, marginal pioneering land to the hippies under a scheme called the Ogu scheme. Many of these were set up and some survived. This block of land at the Argo Abu Valley was leased to an Ogu and it ran from 1974 to 1996. This was strange because you had a pr private property relationship with the land, but the Ogu, um, the Ogu was a commune. Within the Ogu, all of the land was communally owned. They leased the whole block of land from the government but within the Yahoo, the land was community owned. Buildings were occupied and used by the people who built them, and the land and the pasture um, and some of the buildings were also communal. So within the Yahoo, there was a return to a communal ownership of the land, which was in large part inspired by the Mali ways of living with the land from before. So um, it was also a return to the pioneer lifestyles of the colonial period, um, of small holdings and self-sufficiency. So um, during the 80s, the government offered the land to the hippies to buy it, but they didn't want it. They refused to buy it because they didn't believe in ownership of the land. <clears throat> so eventually, uh, the access to the property is a really difficult place to get to. Um, to get there from here, you have to drive out of town, you have to go across a river, um, you have to walk for two hours. It's a difficult place to get to. Um, this access and also the needs of the children who were growing up there who were becoming teenagers and wanting to be part of the city um, meant that the original founders left the over in the 90s. And eventually the lease lapsed and the land reverted to the state. And then um, the state handed it over to the National Park. It became conservation land. Um, so, in a way, it became public again, that land. It became a national treasure for everyone. But also, it became even further removed from the people, because in the national park, you're not allowed to settle, you're not allowed to build, you're not allowed to farm, you're not allowed to hunt. You can only really be an animal or enjoy the scenery. Um, so, in the 90s, uh, there was a big resurgence of Maori culture, and they came the desire to right the wrongs of the previous era. Um, and there were, in this area where we lived, there were many uh, occupations where um, Māori occupied land they in order to reaffirm their claims. And they contested and re-evaluated the original sales, many of which were not, um, were not just, through an ongoing process called the Waitangi Tribunal. And so, at present, the uh, the confiscation of the Ogu for roads is currently being re-evaluated in the courts of law. And the buildings stand empty. They're not maintained by the Department of Conservation. They're not occupied by a new generation of environmentalists. 
can also be used by the local Ibi, the Mali locals. And until the settlement can be found, it will stay that way. The tangle of different ownership claims makes the place stand empty. So I just want to talk quickly about um, the connection to the land. So through repeated use over years and generations, through eating food from the land, through being supported by the land, the connection builds up. For Mali, this connection has always been and remains extremely strong. For the pioneers who lived in the Abu Abu Valley, um, for the hippies whose children were born there, a similar connection grew up. When people who have built up a connection with land are disconnected from it, it is like being disconnected from part of yourself. Land becomes part of identity and opens up the possibility for an effort of land use. That disconnection is a painful process for people. In Europe, the time of pioneering and ritual connection to the land is long past. We've become accustomed to property rights and other abstractions. We've built new spaces on the internet and computers. What's interesting to me is that the current generation of people can have equally strong relationships with code as with land. In open source software, a legal structure of ownership is asserted to copyright. Open source software respects the legal fact that code is property. And then the free software license uses this right of ownership to establish communal ownership of the code. Anyone is free to use the software and the code as long as they grant the same rights to any other people. This is really similar for me to the OGU, where the legal right, in that case the lease, established a property relationship. And within that lease, the hippies operated communally and shared in the use of the OGU. And they built up a relationship with the land in the same way that Amali had built up a relationship with the land, uh, which became part of their identity. In the same way, free software coders build up a relationship with the code, and the code becomes part of their identity. So, uh, now we're in an era where some of these Māori land claims are successful and the land goes into the ownership of a trust. This trust might have 2,000 members and it effectively becomes again communal ownership. In the end, these proxy structures, the free software structure, the structure of the OHU, the structure of the trust, depend on the state to establish and enforce the property right. Um, and that can be a problem, as in the early release reversing to the state. But I think that maybe open source can offer a mechanism for creating communal ownership structures for land, and perhaps some of these structures could foster a richer social use of the land, and with it, the possibility of re-establishing meaningful connections to it. That's it.